think you know anything about Harry Styles. <laughs> Our communities. I'm gonna talk about it again, so I told y'all, I told y'all so. Our culture. I am a Sam Smith. Stan I will be Sam's Same. representative. Our story. It's also not a requirement for you to agree. Mm -hmm. Our opinion. This, this is, is the culture of horror. And we are back for this week's episode of The Culture Report. So to start the show off, we want to honor AAPI Month. So I'm going to toss it over to Alexia. All right. So May is Asian American and Pacific Islanders Heritage Month. This is a month where we celebrate and acknowledge the historic achievements of members of the Asian American and Pacific Islanders communities and their impact on American history. So this all started back in 1977 when U.S. Congress chose the first 10 days of May to recognize Asian Pacific Americans. This later became the whole month. And if you're wondering why May, this was the month where the first Japanese immigrant came to the U.S. in 1843 and when the complete of the Transcontinental Railroad happened, a project where more than 20,000 Japanese workers participated in. And during this month, people all over the country support and honor the AAPI community. Here in Denver, one local artist is painting a mural that will honor Denver's Chinatown, which was destroyed in 1880 by a violent mob fueled by racism. The mural will be, symbolize how even though Chinatown disappeared, descendants are still living in the city. The mural is expected, expected to be done by the end of May. Back in 2021, California's uh, governor helped assemble a task force to help find ways to make up for lasting injustices and discrimination stemming from slavery. Well, they came up with a plan, but now he's declining to publicly say whether or not he supports it. So basically, the task force wants California to pay up. The recommendation breaks those payments down by different types of historical discrimination. For instance, each person that qualifies would receive money for things like health care, disparities, house dis housing discrimination, as well as mass incarceration and over-policing. Each one is valued at a different amount and depends on how long the person has lived in the state. So Democratic Governor Gavin Newsom says that he believes that this is about much more than money. So he told Fox News the state has already been taking care of most of the, ta most of the task force action items, including quote, addressing breaking down barriers to vote, bolstering resources to address hate, enacting sweeping law enforcement and justice reforms to build trust and safety and strengthening economic mobility. So he says he doesn't think it's all about money, which is not all about money, but I think money is a big part. Yes. I mean, like they say cash is king, money matters. And I feel like it's, that would help with the advancement of black people, I think, especially. Yes, black people have been historic, historically marginalized in this company, uh, in this country, I should say, um, and we haven't been able to build generational wealth like other groups of people have been able to. And I think providing reparations has been long overdue. So to see California taking steps to do that, it makes me want to become a Californian. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love it. But do you think it's more like a political stunt when that first happened? Um, well, I know a lot of the people that oppose it or his critics say that it was, and I think it was. I do think he, I believe that he thinks that, you know, we deserve something. Mm -hmm. But when he assembled this task force in 2021, I think that he just, one, it looked good for him, and two, like, I don't know, maybe he thought nothing would come of it, but when they said, hey, we want each person to get millions of dollars, he was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's not about money all of a sudden so i'm like don't ask black people what they want and then when mm -hmm. they ask for it be like it's not about that like who yeah. are you like oh, as a white man you can't tell me that what i'm telling you i want and what will make up for it is it enough or I'm, is it i'm hoping it's not a political stunt i'm hoping that it's on, like an honest uh attempt to to uh, heal those relations that have hurt or harmed black mm -hmm. people and to give us a step forward in building generational wealth in our families, it, it, well, specifically in California. I think, well, I hope so. I don't know where they're gonna get the money from. I really- That ain't our problem. They can find it. <laughs> <laughs> they found the slaves, they can find the money. Mm -hmm. They found the PPP loans. Mm -hmm. they can, right. Yeah, we'll surely be following that one. But speaking of reparations, in Denver, City Councilwoman Candy C. DeBaca suggested her own form of reparation, reparations. She suggested that Denver's white-owned businesses pay an extra tax to fund minority-owned businesses. C. DeBaca has not made a proposal, but the race based taxation idea has prompted challenges on constitutional grounds. Capitalism was built on stolen land, stolen labor, and stolen resources. And a 
check today could not um, undo the cumulative impact of generations of that stolen wealth in all of those categories. And so I think it has to come in the form of land, labor, and resources in an ongoing fashion. I think this is a really good way to start yeah. fighting like you know these small owned businesses that are facing you know challenges with development and gentrification so I think you know it'd be a good idea to tax them I, I think it's going to be an issue with it being <laughs> race based. Be <laughs> I'm very conflicted because yes I do think that we should reparations are in order however I don't know if that's the right way to go about it. I don't know the right way to go about it but Putting taxes on people just because they're white does not feel right. Well, well, you know, people of color and black people and minority people in general have a harder time achieving uh, or, or going after getting money and capital to build their businesses. Mm -hmm. So it's harder for them to become entrepreneurs and business owners. So for me, this is, yeah. yes. And it's not just that, it's just surviving. You go, you know, areas here even of Denver and you're like seeing all these new businesses, new homes and barely see any that have been around for, for a long time. So. Yeah. I think this this is similar to she mentioned she cited a program that they have in San Francisco which basically um, you know pays these minorities but they don't use race so oh, gotcha. mm -hmm. be interesting to see what happens but I'm sure it's gonna continue facing a lot of challenges I'm here for it also yes All right. <laughs> Find the money somewhere righty, protest ha uh, protest in New York have erupted after a 30 year old man died on the subway when another rider put him in a chokehold this was following an altercation uh, they had. His name was Jordan Neely. He was a Michael Jackson impersonator and an entertainer who often performed on the sub, uh, New York subways. Witnesses on the subway said Neely, who appeared to be struggling with mental health issues, was aggressively asking for food and water and said that he didn't mind going to jail. Witnesses also said they never, that he never became physically violent. A uh, 24-year-old former Marine placed Neely in the chokehold for about 15 minutes, according to a witness. He was questioned and released by police. No charges have been filed at this point. But a friend of Neely spoke with CNN and had this to say about his death. What do you want to see happen here? The same thing that happens that I've seen multiple times when someone uh, commits fare evasion and they get arrested instantly. Well, someone murdered someone in the train station. They need to be arrested. It's a murder. I can ask five-year-olds in a kindergarten class, what do you think should happen? And it's common sense mathematics. You don't need a degree to figure out what needs to happen. Accountability, accountability, accountability. I refuse to believe that the Marines are represented by people who would do something like this. This is not how we treat, this is not how we're supposed to treat people, even when they're in a state where they're having an episode. We're supposed to use intelligence and compassion and know how to talk to each other. Joining us is our legal expert, Whitney Trailer. So thanks for joining us. Sure, it's great to be here on the Culture Report. I think one of the questions I had about this case uh, is did the Marine and the other people there in that situation have a duty to de-escalate or what was their duty in that situation? That's a great question in the way you phrase it in terms of well, what was their actual duty because everybody's looking at, well, did he have the right to restrain him in that way? And you're asking it a different way saying, well, what was their duty as they're watching this unfold? And so a lot of it is gonna depend on what happened before we saw the video. Was it, uh, because there's, there's a couple things. Was it murder? Murder requires an intent to kill. So, uh, you know, almost premeditated. And so as they're watching him, I think a, a first degree murder charge is gonna be difficult in the sense of, um, yeah, this was, he had an intent to kill. But at what point, they're definitely gonna use self-defense. So if you look at a second degree, was he negligent? In other words, had he, um, de-escalated the situation enough because if before the video started they had a, a legitimate concern that there was imminent serious bodily injury that could happen to them then he has a right to defend himself and others that's the question though. right but then like 15 minutes is just excessive at this point well I I have to believe that in you know in this modern day we've come to rely on video evidence which we can see with our own eyes and here yes 
you could see it there. There is no, in my opinion, from a legal analysis, there's no harm at that point. And certainly when he went unconscious. And that, of course, this brings back, you know, the, the George Floyd situation because the, the medical examiner determined that it was a death because of a compression of the neck. Mm -hmm. and, and so when the, when the person is unconscious, how can you say, yeah, I still believe there was a serious threat? And there were other patrons who got on the subway and said, you're killing him. And one guy even said he's unconscious and defecating on himself, which a lot of medical people will say, yeah, that's what happens as you're dying out. And then there were two people also holding him down. So, I mean, it's going to be really hard to say he was a threat if, if that's the case. And Yeah, I'm not sure what, how much uh, video they have, but I know that one thing that will be fundamentally important is talking to all of the witnesses because the, the allegation is that um, Jordan Neely was, you know, being aggressive and people were nervous and all that. But I would, if the police and the investigators should try and get everybody on that train and say, did you feel this threat? Mm -hmm. Did he ever get violent? Because if he never initiated any contact and was just verbally, you know, could there have been other yeah. steps that, that you could have taken? And I'd be shocked if they, uh, if they said, no, there were no other steps. But again, when he's unconscious, that's where the case really uh, ends for me because th th there was no threat and it was a couple minutes more that he continued to, to choke him. Yeah. I think the first thing that came to mind for me was when I watched it, I, I, I consider New York home. I lived there for many, many years. And you see this kind of interaction a lot. You see people struggling with homelessness. You see people struggling on the subway with mental health issues. And I've, I've been in situations just like this before where you have to de-escalate or just like, so I, I, mm -hmm. I don't understand the response, and it felt very non-New Yorkish of me of, yes, of that of situation mm -hmm. because you usually see New York as a community pulling together. So to see two other people holding him down. Mm -hmm. So I think my question was, why, if this was ruled a homicide, mm -hmm. was he not arrested? Is that like? Right. Or like, is that how things usually take place? No, sometimes it can, though, because here the police were the first ones there and they chose not to issue the ticket. And I think another issue that amplifies the situation is the fact that he's a Marine. So clearly he's going to be trained. He's going to have more uh, understanding on on all of these issues, on physical force and everything yes. else than the, than, the, than the average person. And so will that... Uh, create a higher level of culpability knowing it's almost like well your hands were a lethal weapon and here in that case I mean it wasn't like he uh, you know did some green beret on him or something yeah, right. but holding him in that chokehold as a marine you have extra training so um, yeah I think that that is going to be an issue as well what about consequences for the spectators, the people that were just sitting there and watching it? Mm -hmm. Well, that's going to be so tough because as people will surely testify, they'll say, well, it just happened so quick. I didn't know what to do. And so some people are going to say, well, thank goodness, because he was making me nervous. But that's going to come back to, did Jordan Neely ever really put anybody in physical force or was he just having kind of a mental breakdown? Mm -hmm. So the people who are watching in terms of bystanders, I don't think they'll have any liability because, of course, they didn't understand, is he killing him or what have you. But the fact that there were people who said, you're killing him, stop, that, that is going to be relevant towards um, uh, Daniel Penny, the, the, the man who, who choked him. I, I mean, I think he's going to be, I think it's with, with a grand jury now or they're convening a grand jury. And so I would expect some, at least a, a negli uh, negligent, homicide, uh, yeah. second degree manslaughter, something where it was uh, an unnecessary use of force. Because you have to remember, with self-defense, you're allowed to use a certain amount of force that's necessary to uh, eliminate the, the threat. And this was totally unnecessary. Yeah, exactly. But this is something we're going to be following. But thank you for joining us and like giving us that information. For sure. Thank you. <laughs> well, hey, I'll be back next yeah. week then. <laughs> All right. Well, right now, a community in Allen, Texas, is mourning the loss of eight people killed in a mass shooting at an outlet mall. Police say the shooter was armed with an AR-15 style rifle, a handgun, and tactical gear. So after killing eight people and wounding at least seven others, a police officer killed the shooter. So three children died, including a three-year-old and both of his parents. Since then, NBC reports that the shooter's social media pages were filled with anti-Jewish hate and bigotry towards minorities and women. Investigators say they're looking into that, though so right now it isn't clear if that was a motive. 
So as with every mass shooting this country has endured, thoughts and prayers have poured in and many gun owners and opposers alike say that just won't cut it. To see your son come out with his hands over his heads and have to walk past dead bodies, it's not something any parent or anybody should ever have to see or experience. And I, I have guns, I've been around guns, I love my guns, but those automatic rifles that are on the streets need to come off the streets. Today I'm mad. I'm mad because, you know, there will be politicians that will stand up and give interviews and say our prayers and hearts go out to the victims and their families and the first responders, but these prayers are useless without meaningful gun control legislation that takes dangerous weapons out of the hands of people that don't belong to have them. Right. It's very interesting to hear that perspective from a gun owner, especially yeah. because we've been hearing like all this, like, hey, like we need a stricter gun laws from all these like anti-gun groups. So to hear it coming from people with the guns, apparently something needs to change. I feel like it's a conversation we keep having, keep having, probably will continue having. Um, but it's interesting to, to hear from someone in a group that identifies with loving guns, having guns, owning guns, that's that kind of stuff. Because usually it's painted in a way it's like these people are anti-guns. But to see this and have to see the massacre of children and other people, like I, I, I don't understand how it couldn't touch anyone or someone couldn't feel moved, especially being there, seeing that and witnessing it. So we, there's a lot that needs to change and it, it needs to start with gun legislation. Yeah, that too, but right now they're like painting it in a different way. Now they're blaming like, or ABBA is blaming it on mental health as the root. So I feel like that's like a shield to kind of deter the, you know, mm. the attention from gun laws or right. gun reform. But mm. it's, it's funny that he's so contradictory because he defunded the, that program last year where he, he took, he sliced it. So if you are saying that's the mental root, you know, the, or the, the, the root of yeah. the issue, then why are you not, you know, funding this program? Because yeah. that's my question. I'm like, if you're going to continue to say, this is why everybody's dying, what resources are you putting into mental health? Like, don't just say that, use that as an excuse, especially now, since everyone's really hyper aware of mental health and it's very, it's big now. So they think they can just lean on that, but they no, please, mm. let's not do that. I hope it doesn't and, become uh, background in the, yeah. you know, just background noise shootings. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, this one, I saw some images that I wish I would have never seen, and I feel, yeah. like, traumatized this whole week just from the images. Just, like, scrolling through Twitter, just, like, looking under the hashtag. I was just curious on what people were saying, and unfortunately, I stumbled upon pictures I wish I would have never seen in my life. Yeah. And I, I don't know how lawmakers can see those pictures and not do anything. Right. And That's be at the scene, and, like, you know what I mean? I, I, I force myself to view those videos. Because I feel like I have a responsibility to be a part of the, the movement of change to make sure this doesn't continue happening. Right. And I feel like by not engaging or in, in, in interacting and seeing those, those things, even though it's super, super heavy, I feel like I have to, to not become apathetic to it or, or become numb to this continuously happening because it happens so often. Yeah. Similarly to how we see like unarmed black people or something in their interaction with their police that end up becoming lethal. Like I always make sure that I have a duty to like watch those interaction, watch those videos when they're released because I feel like I need to, to inform myself. Oh, see, for me, I feel like I, I really look into like the victim. I don't want to know them at, in that way that they were last seen. Yeah. That's unfortunate for me. Like I don't want, I don't think they want to be remembered as that. I know it's obviously a movement, but just like, with this shooting, it was like a whole family's dead. Yeah. yeah. There's a mother and her father, like a mother with her two True. kids are dead. Like, I don't understand how lawmakers are not doing anything. Like, this one has been really hard on me this week. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I, I just don't understand how it's still happening. And, like, I, now I go to places, and I'm like, when is it, when is it going to happen? Like, yeah. I was in San Diego this yeah. weekend, and we were at a Cinco de Mayo event, and there was tons of people, and I'm like, mm -hmm. I don't even feel safe here because you don't know. You don't know. Right. At this rate, I feel like everyone's going to be personally, like, it's going to happen to some, like, they're going to have a personal impact by it somehow at this rate. So hopefully lawmakers will get it together. Yes. Some change will come. All right, guys. Well, let's move on to something else. The pandemic era measure known as Title 42, which allowed the U.S. to expel hundreds of thousands of migrants, expired May 11th. Thousands of migrants are already waiting at the border and more are expected to come. Immigration lawyer Belen Albuja talked about Title 42 and how, how the current situation at the border is only one part of
of a greater problem with the legal system in the U.S. I think that legally it's time to realize that the problem is not only at the border. Uh, the United States needs to have a legal system that works. Uh, the problem right now is that because of the implementation of Title 42, many years ago when the COVID started, this is just a consequence of that implementation. So um, right now, all the uh, asylum seekers that we have at the border are here because of, of course, economic problems that happen in Latin America, but it's also a consequence of what happened during COVID. That is just hard to, to hear, to know that it's finally come to a moment where, you know, government has to react and we have to prepare even here locally in Denver. Mm -hmm. um, right now, because all this funding for, you know, to help the migrants comes unsecured, um, right. all of them have to have some sort of connection with immigration as they're coming in so they get a number and that's the only way they're gonna actually have shelter here in Denver. Um, so, you know, they're really calling out on nonprofits to jump in and help a lot of these migrants coming in. Yeah, and now we'll revert yeah. back to Title Eight this time. So under Title Forty Two, they were able to like come in during the pandemic like a few times, multiple times, just, multiple times. But now it's just like you get one time, we'll deport you, and if you try again, like they're harsher, harsher, a lot of harsher. Like they can even two years yeah, in jail. Yeah, in jail. so that's really scary. They're really encouraging people to use the legal pathways that Biden set up. So we'll definitely be following what happens. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. and I hope someone's down there letting them know that hey, things are changing. And amid the growing humanitarian crisis along the southern border, one community in Brownsville, Texas, is mourning eight lives lost after an SUV plowed into a crowd waiting at a bus stop near a migrant center. The suspect, 34-year-old George Alvarez, was charged with eight counts of manslaughter. Authorities are still trying to determine a motive. Yeah, I just hope with like situations like this, like someone's not trying to be a copycat, you know, because we don't know the motive. Maybe this person was just didn't like what was going on with the migrants, and I hope this doesn't influence somebody else it's to try vicious, to do something yeah, like this. It's a vicious cycle, because this happened, we were reported, it's in the news, someone else gets an idea, they start planning, it happens again, and just a vicious cycle that continues to harm uh, v very vulnerable groups of people, especially yeah. migrant people that come here to, to seek a better life. So, so scary to see that. It's very scary. Yeah. Yeah. And not just at the border. Like, this is everywhere. Any migrant shelters anywhere, they could be a target, too. Right. So I'm sure that has... I mean, those people scared, people that work there are scared. So, I mean, it sucks that they have to keep their guard up like that. So hopefully they have like some extra security or some sort of measures in place to make sure that didn't happen. Okay, so we're gonna hop into the good news. We have a little, or shall I say a, a big update. Dennis Barnes, the black high school student from New Orleans who received more than $10 million in scholarship offers from more than 185 colleges has chosen a school. Barnes announced that he plans to attend Cornell University, where he plans to study computer science and eventually work in software development. Shakira delivered a powerful speech on womanhood when accepting the Women of the Year Award at the Billboard's Latin Women in Music Gala. The singer said music helped her find herself when she felt most lost and she shared crucial lessons she learned from women when she, and she quoted, it's been a year where I've realized we women are stronger than we think, braver than we believed, and more independent than we thought we were thought to be. All right. Take a look at this cute moment from the Little Mermaid premiere in Hollywood. Yes, that's both Ariel's Haley Bailey and Jody Benson met at this week's premiere. Bailey stars in the upcoming film coming out this, later this month, and Benson is the original voice actor for the character. And some other good news, despite backlash on the casting of Ariel, the movie received positive reviews from critics. The movie comes out May 26th. Right, and the Drag Isn't Dangerous telethon live streamed on May 7. It raised over $500,000 for LGBTQ plus charities, uh, supporting out of work drag artists and transgender people. So several drag performers joined and several notable celebrities like Adam Lambert, Charlize Theron, Sarah Silverman, and Melissa McCarthy also made appearances. I love it. So I really love that people with that platform are really coming in to speak out. I love it. I already have my Little Mermaid <laughs> ticket. I will be there. I will be present. It's I, I, I'm glad that it got good reviews. I'm really excited. Now I'm like, I'm, I might go see it now. Oh, I, yeah, so, so I will buy everyone's ticket. We're going in. <laughs> okay. It's happening. I feel like we've been waiting for that one for a long time. Yeah. So, yeah. Oh, long finally. Time. Yeah. <laughs> So you could join us, uh, join the conversation with us by emailing us at culturereport at 9news.com and let us know what good you're seeing in the culture. 
All right, thank you for joining us for this episode of The Culture Report. We'll be back to continue the conversation next Thursday right here on our free 9 News Plus app and 9news.com.